Thank you, Mark. We have a uh, church-wide retreat going on, family camp, they call it, and I was out there Friday and then yesterday, and it's a good crowd, and they're having a good time together, young people, old people alike, and uh, they're getting very good instruction from Mike Black. I was able to hear two of his lessons and uh, thoroughly enjoyed what he had to say. But uh, I thought since we have so many people absent this Sunday, it would be good to take a break from the book of Colossians. So that's what we're doing. And we're going to look at Psalm 31, and then we'll be back in Colossians next Sunday. And it's a great psalm we're going to look at. Um, all about the Lord being our fortress. It's a psalm of David, and it begins, In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. In your hand, I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten as a dead man, out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. For I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage all you who hope in the Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. High King of heaven and ruler over all, that is really what our psalm is about, praise of God. 
If you've ever taken a tour to Israel, you no doubt visited Masada, the fortress King Herod built on a plateau overlooking the Dead Sea out in the desert. It was designed to be an impregnable fortress. He had 15 storehouses filled with provisions, deep cisterns that filled up with rainwater. Herod even had a bathhouse. He could have lived there for years if he had to. I mention that because Masada is the Hebrew word for fortress. The writer used it in a few places in our psalm, Psalm 31, to describe the Lord as his fortress. Everyone wants a fortress in this world. They try to find it in things, in a bank account, or a job, or relationships, whatever they think will give them an edge and give them security in an unstable world. But the world offers nothing that is secure. Masada had a spectacular fall when the Roman legions built a massive siege ramp and breached the walls. Only the Lord is an impregnable fortress. In verse 15, the psalmist writes of the Lord's hand. In my times, my my times are in your hand. That is the securest place to be. That's the confidence the psalmist expresses in Psalm 31. Confidence along with concern. In fact, reading Psalm 31 is a little like riding a roller coaster. It's an emotional psalm in which, as one writer put it, the psalmist's spirit rises and falls. It's a psalm of hope and fear, glory and gloom. Derek Kidner wrote in his little commentary on the psalms that the unusual feature of the psalm is that it moves twice from anguish to assurance. That's the pattern in verses 1 through 8 and then in verses 9 through 24. Maybe that's because the psalmist wanted to explore the problem of anxiety and relief more closely the second time. So he spends a little more time on that subject. Or it's because that's the way things often are. We don't always get things settled in our minds decisively and conclusively. We get the victory, and then over time we fall back into spiritual uncertainty, (coughs) doubt, and fear. That's typical. That's continual. That's, That's the spiritual battle for the child of God. So Kidner outlines the psalm in two parts, verses 1 through 8 and verses 9 through 24. I'm going to look at it according to... uh, a lot of the English versions which divide the psalm into five paragraphs or stanzas. It is a prayer, like so many of the psalms, and it's a prayer for the faithful in the struggle of life. The psalmist worries out loud about the dangers, but ends triumphantly urging us to be strong and have courage. Now, why is that? Because he knew that that we in ourselves are able to overcome any problem that faces us, that if we just draw deeply on that reserve within us, that we can do whatever we need to do, we can overcome the problems of life. No, it's because the Lord is sufficient, not because we are sufficient. He is all-powerful, and He is faithful, and He is always with us. And the psalmist knew that to be true because he knew the Lord. He knew the Lord intellectually and he knew him experientially. Psalm combines a knowledge of God with a personal encounter with God. And that, I think, is the way it always is for the Christian. If we believe, if we believe, we will be obedient. And then we will experience the hand of God and we will see it in our lives as the psalmist did. That's obvious in the first two paragraphs. The the psalmist was David who spent all his life fighting or fleeing. When he was a shepherd, he 
killed a lion and a bear defending the flock. He killed a giant defending God's name. He killed scores of uncircumcised Philistines defending king and country. Then for years he was a fugitive running from Saul with, as he put it, but a step between me and death. Even after he became king, he had to deal with palace intrigue and threats on his life. Where the psalm fits in all of that's not altogether clear, but, but clearly he faced an existential threat. His life was in mortal danger. Still, David didn't lean on his skill as a warrior, but on the Lord. He hid in him. That's how he begins the psalm. He begins his prayer as our prayers must begin with faith in the Lord. He calls him his refuge. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. In the next verses, he refers to the Lord as his rock of strength, his stronghold, his rock, and his fortress. All of these were the kind of places where David found safety in the high hills and caves of the Judean desert while he was running from Saul. He saw them as pictures of the Lord and the protection that he gives. The Lord God is like a strong fortress, like a Masada, only his walls can't be breached. And it was with that confidence that David prays throughout the paragraph that the Lord would save him from some great danger. Deliver me, he says. Be to me a rock of strength. And that tells us something about the Christian life and Christian prayer. It is essential that we have our doctrine right, our understanding of God's Word correctly, and that we understand the nature of God, that, that He is sovereign, righteous, and faithful. We need to understand that, know that about Him. He is able to do what is impossible for man to do. But He's not only able, He is willing and eager to help us. We need to understand that and in one sense rest in it while at the same time we need to act upon it. The Christian life is not passive. It is not indolent. It is not trust the Lord and do nothing. It is aggressive in the sense that we are aggressive in our faith our obedience according to the Word of God. James Boyce wrote, Do you believe that God is all-powerful? Of course you do. Then pray that He will prove Himself strong in your weakness. Do you believe that God is wise? Of course. Then ask Him to display His wisdom in ordering your life. Ask Him to be what the Bible says that He is. He's sovereign. So ask Him to order things in His providence in a way that is a blessing for you and will bring honor to Him. That's, that's what David was doing. His last statement in the paragraph in verse 5 is another statement of complete confidence in the Lord. Confidence that the Lord will be for him, which is what the Bible promises that He will be. He will be for us. Verse 5. Because, wrong psalm. Verse 5. In your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Charles Spurgeon said, these living words of David were our Lord's dying words. Jesus studied Psalm 31. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. They were the final words of many people who died heroic deaths in their faith. Uh, Huss, Luther, Melanchthon, and others. David was asking the Father to save his life from death. Christ was committing his soul to the Father to bring him safely through death into his presence. Both had confidence that the Lord would do that, would deliver them. 
because of their knowledge of God's character and promises, but also because of their past experience. David recounts that in the next paragraph. But first in verse 6, he again expresses his faith in the Lord when he dismisses the idols of the world, the, the things that, that the men of this world trust in. He dismisses them as vain or literally as empty vapor. That's, that's the literal understanding of it. In other words, there's nothing there. The gods of the Gentiles are, are just objects of man's imagination. They may be covered with... Uh, silver and gold, they may be impressive objects, but there is no life in them and there is no help in them. There's only one God, the triune God. That's who David said, I trust in. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness. Now that word loving kindness is a very important word in the scriptures. It's the word of covenant. It's about covenant love and it speaks of his unfailing love and commitment to those that he's brought into a relationship with himself. He is absolutely faithfully committed to his people. And David knew that. First of all, he knew that from scripture. It's what the word of God teaches. But he also knew it from experience. I will rejoice, he said, because you have seen my affliction. You've seen it, and you'll act upon it. Idols have eyes, but they don't see. Idols have feet, but they don't walk. That's Psalm 115. <coughs> they have hands, but they don't feel. In other words, they've got all the parts that we would look for. Eyes, mouth, hands, feet, but they don't work. There's no life there, and there's no life there because they're not real, and therefore they don't give any help. It's an illusion. The Lord is real. The Lord has life. The Lord has power. He has infinite power, and he acts upon what he sees. That's what David is saying here. And that was David's experience. Verse 8. And you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. Many times the, the Lord kept him out of the hand of Saul. As he told Jonathan, there is hardly a step between me and death. But there was a step, and that was enough. God may let the enemy get close, close enough for us to know that there's an enemy and there's danger and we need to look to the Lord. That's what uh, the trials of life have, have in our life, have the positive uh, result of the, of the trials of life in our, in our lives do for us. They cause us to, to get a realistic look at life and look to the one, the only one who can help. And that was David. That was his experience. And he would look to him. And he would keep him safe, and he will do the same for us. He keeps us safe. David's experience was, was that. Oh, there's just a step between me and death, but that was, that was enough. And that step was always there, and the Lord was always protecting him. And he see it, saw it all through his life. He saw it in the Valley of Elah when he met Goliath, and he saw it in the wilderness of Judea when he was fleeing from, from uh, Saul and all of his madness. So he knew firsthand the Lord's loving kindness, his faithful love. That gave him confidence for a time. But then in the next, next paragraph, or the, the second section of the psalm, according to Derek Kidner, it is again suffering and sorrow. This is an emotional portion of the psalm. In verses 9 and 10, David describes the the effects of his troubles on him, on his body and soul. So on the whole man, he, he describes his eye wasting away from grief and his life was spent in sorrow. His strength, he said, had failed him. The problem was more one of the soul, the mind and emotions, more a problem of anxiety than one of physical illness. He, he worried. And the reason is given in verse 13. 
He says he was surrounded by enemies. For I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. This may refer to all the Gentile enemies that surrounded the nation. Or it may have been something more local, like plots on his, from his own people against him, um, as with the rebellion of his son Absalom. Or maybe it's about Saul's persecution of him. However we understand it, David had numerous and powerful enemies who were seeking his ruin. And because he seemed weak and seemed vulnerable at the time, surrounded by all of these overwhelming enemies, because of that, people deserted him. Verse 11, those who see me in the street flee from me. Verse 12, I am forgotten as a dead man. Out of mind. This is the way of the world. Just as victory has a thousand fathers and defeat is an orphan, times of weakness or failure are often lonely times for those who are going through those difficulties. Times when friends and allies melt away and turn away. People like winners. They like success. And when David seemed to be near defeat, people deserted him. He was being slandered and surrounded, he said, by terror. But David had been, had been in danger like this before, and the Lord had delivered him. He described that earlier in verses 7 and 8. He, he wrote that the Lord knew the troubles of his soul. That word troubles is from the word narrow. It speaks of being in a confined place, hemmed in, uh, surrounded by enemies and, and without options, without a way out. He, he was in dire straits. Recently read a book on archaeology. One of the stories the archaeologist told was of exploring one of the smaller pyramids of Egypt. Entering it, it, he said, was an extremely claustrophobic experience. So I probably should have stopped reading it at that point, but uh, I read on and he explained and described how he had to bend his head in order not to hit the ceiling. His shoulders uh, scraped the walls on either side as he walked through one of the inner corridors. He wrote of in his words, the oppressive feeling of having tons and tons of rock above him. He was closed in, unable to move, and it was troubling. It was distressing. David was in a similar situation, closed in on every side. But the Lord knew the troubles of his soul and delivered him from a tight place and set his feet, verse 8 says, in a broad, a large, a spacious place. Set him free from, from a tomb into the open air. The Lord had done that in the past, and David knew that he could do it again. He knew the Lord was good for his word. He knew the Lord's loving kindness cannot fail. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises. He knew the Lord's character. Knew it intellectually and knew it by experience. Are you in a tight place? When I said in the prayer, I, some of us are. We don't know who it is. I don't. And I don't know the circumstances that you're in today or what you'll be in tomorrow. But everybody at some time or another finds himself or herself in a tight place in difficulty, like David. David's enemies surrounded him. His friends forgot him. They deserted him. But the Lord didn't. He never does. David knew that, and we need to know that. This is as real and true for us today as it was for him 3,000 years ago. That's why he was praying to the Lord. And so his spirit rises again, the fourth paragraph begins with another statement of faith and confidence in the Lord. Verse 14, But as for me, I trust you, O Lord. 
I say, you are my God. The emphasis in the original text is on I and you. David was stating emphatically his complete trust in the Lord regardless of circumstances. Hard and dispiriting as they were. In spite of that, he was trusting in the Lord. Again, he knew the Lord with his mind and he knew the Lord with his experience. He understood the revelation of God in Scripture and he believed it. And he had witnessed the Lord's faithfulness in his life. And so here in verse 14, he makes a firm declaration of faith. Derek Kidner wrote, David rests or takes back the initiative from his enemies and deliberately turns in a new direction. Deliberately does that. I think that's a good way of putting it. David Martin Lloyd-Jones said, either in a, a sermon or a book, something that stayed with me. He said, you have got to preach to yourself. Every Christian has to preach to himself or herself. Every Christian is a preacher. Uh, we, we need to take things in hand and we need to declare to, our, to ourselves that God's Word is true. Tell ourselves that. Remind ourselves of it. God's Word is true. The Lord is God. God Almighty. He's greater than all circumstances. And we need not to despair. Trust in Him. That's the sermon we need to continually preach, preach to ourselves. David did that and, and gave a magnificent statement of praise and confidence in verse 15. It, it magnifies the sovereignty of God. Well, if you, can, if you can magnify that which is infinite and eternal, it, it certainly focuses upon that, illuminates that. Our security in Him, our, His personal care of us. Verse 15, My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. I have to say, this is really the, the, the verse that drew me to this psalm. My times are in your hand. That's a great statement. It's a, a beautiful picture. Faith in that, in that great truth that our times are in His hands will quiet all the fears of life. Nothing happens by chance is what David is saying. We're not caught in a great machine, but held in the firm hand of God. That's true in the best of times. That's true in the worst of times. Daniel Crawford was a, a Plymouth Brethren missionary to Africa in the late 1800s. He said, when you quote these words, the words of this psalm to an African in my time, or rather, my times are in thy hands. He was forced to translate it in the gorgeous words, all my life's whys and whens and wheres and wherefores are in God's hands. That's a good explanation and encouragement. The expression, my times, indicates a lot of things. It indicates the, the transience of life, the, the, the temporal nature of life, that life is brief and life is changing. We see it in ourselves. The outer man is decaying. We see it in our surroundings. The, the world around us is always changing. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is certain in life. That, that's disturbing. But there is reassurance from the expression in your hand because that does not change. It's absolutely stable. It refers to the Lord's personal relationship with us, His absolute power. His hand is strong. And that's, there's a metaphor you understand. God is spirit. doesn't have a hand or feet or eyes or whatever. But it speaks of His power, His strength, which is directed to us. It keeps us safe. And it directs us in life. It's a way of saying that the Lord has us securely in His care, and He cares for us. 
That's how Martin Luther understood this verse. It was a great comfort when he experienced bad health, which he did so often. In fact, he said it was during an illness that he learned to understand this verse. He explained my times as meaning my whole life, all my days, hours and moments are in God's hands. It's as if I should say my health and sickness, fortune and misfortune, life and death, joy and sorrow are in thy hand. And he said, experience bears this out. And then he stated how we make our plans for our happiness or security and things don't turn out the way we had planned them to turn out. Well, that's really Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And really, would, would you have it any other way? Do you really want to be guiding your life through the, the dangers of this world? I mean, that's, that's like flying through a, a, an asteroid belt. Stuff comes at us fast and furiously. And I'm happy to have the Lord overturn my decisions. Well, I say that I, during the experience of it, I'm oftentimes not happy about it. Not when things don't go the way I had planned them. But then what do I know about things? What do I know about life? He is omniscient. He is all wise. And if I believe that he's the God of this psalm and he's the God that David trusted in, then I can trust him to make those decisions for me. Now, I'm to make a wise choice in my life. I'm to be doing that daily. But when that's overturned by the providence of God, I need to rest in that and know there is a wise God who rules over everything. He directs things for my good. Now, we know that by faith. That is a prayer of faith based first and foremost on the Word of God, the Lord's revelation of Himself. Are you going to believe it? And are you going to act upon it? That's the, the question that we always face. David answered it here with a yes. He believed and therefore he knew that his life, his times, every part of his life was in God's hand and he rested in that. What a comfort that is. In your hand. Dr. Alois Alzheimer was a German psychiatrist whose name is familiar to all of us because of the disease named after him. Alzheimer's has been called the scourge of the century. The terror of it is captured in the statement Dr. Alzheimer's first patient, Augusta Dieter, made in 1901. She said, I've lost myself. That's scary. A person can be intelligent and have the best education and job make careful plans about his or her future to guarantee financial stability, to ensure a comfortable retirement, and then the mind begins to fail. You cannot get security in this world. At least, you cannot get security from this world. Just as the Roman legions scaled the heights to conquer the impregnable Masada, so too, diseases overtake the strongest, the brightest people. That's true for Christians too. We're not exempt from that. We're not exempt from the trials of life that the world goes through. We all go through them in a fallen world. So what happens when a Christian's memory fades and, and we can't remember who we are, or what we believe, or who we believe in? I've seen that. We're a godly person comes toward the end and doesn't really remember anything, doesn't know much, doesn't know much at all. What happens when we lose ourself? Where does that leave us? It leaves us right where we were at the first moment of faith in Christ's hand. We may lose ourself, but He never loses us. Even those dark times are in His hand. 
Jesus used these words to promise us absolute eternal security in John chapter 10, verse 28, where he said, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Not the devil or your feeble mind, your loss of memory, nothing can make you fall from the almighty hand or from his personal care. His personal care. That too is indicated here in verse 14. David speaks of the Lord as my God. The Lord is personally guiding our lives according to the times he has allotted to us. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by fate. It is all in the Lord's hand. That is what David is saying. That encouraged David. And based on that assurance he had from the reliable, faithful character and power of God, David then prays for God's goodness in verse 16. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. That is simply praying Scripture. That's how we're to pray. You want to pray a correct prayer? Pray Scripture. And David was doing that here. It's Numbers chapter 6, verse 25. The ironic blessing, blessing that the high priest Aaron prayed over the nation, the Lord make His face to shine upon you. That's what David is praying here. May He show His blessings to us as the sun shines its light and warmth on the land. That's experienced most obviously in difficulties when uh, adversity is removed. So David prayed for that. Verse 17, Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. Well, he would do that for David, and he will do that for us, for all his people, because the Lord is against pride and contempt, and he blesses faith and humility. That's the goodness of God. And that's what David praises the Lord for in the last paragraph. Verse 19, how great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. The goodness that God has stored up for us, or the goodness that God has treasured up for us, is eternal. It's unseen. In saying that it's eternal, it's something that you and I don't see in the present necessarily. We do to some extent, but not to the degree that it is treasured up for us. It, it, it is unseen by us. It's unseen by the world. It is beyond our comprehension. It's for those who love Him. It's what Paul is speaking of when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, things which, has not, which, which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Things are prepared for us that haven't even entered our mind. We haven't seen them. We cannot comprehend them. We don't think about them. They're stored up. They're treasured up for those of us who love Him. What we're doing in this life as we walk by faith and rest in His powerful hand that guides us along is producing now as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 4.17, an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. As we live by faith, that's being stored up for us. That's the, the glory to come. It's what your life is producing, what God is producing in you and treasuring up for you as you live by faith and obedience. But... His blessings are not only future, as I said. They are also present, and they are seen. David said, it is wrought, it is that is produced for those who take refuge in the Lord before the sons of men. That is, in their sight. 
They see the goodness of God for us. They may not understand the things that we believe, and they may dismiss the gospel. They may reject a lot, think it's foolish, but then they see things in your life or in my life. They see it. Uh, so his blessings are not all future. They're present, and the world can see that. Maybe it's that they see an order, the orderly life that he gives to you. And if you're living by faith and you're living by obedience, you're going to live an orderly, disciplined life. And they see that, and they notice that's different from what I see around me. Or they see the, the calm that we have as we trust in the Lord in the trials of life. Or they see how the Lord meets our needs in time of difficulty. They, these things are done before them, and they witness this. In David's experience, what men saw was the Lord's protection of him in hostile times. He said in verse 21 that the Lord manifested his loving kindness for him in a besieged city. So there he is, held up in a city, and I take this to be a literal deliverance. I think he's thinking of some city that he was in where his life was in peril and it looked like he's, they've got him now. And then on that occasion, the Lord delivered David from the hand of whoever, maybe Saul. The city was surrounded by enemies, but the Lord himself was the real fortress David hid himself in. While people trust in the things of this world, its fortresses for their uncertain and all too brief futures, we're to trust in the Lord. He alone gives unshakable security in an uncertain, changing world. That's what this world is. There's no security in this world. And that's what David urges in the last two verses of the psalm. Oh, love the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. The Lord ended the upper room discourse in John 16, verse 33, with uh, words very similar to that. He told his disciples, the world would hate them just as it did him. If you're going to be his disciple, if you're going to be his representative in this world, if you're going to be the body of Christ in this world while our head is at the right hand of the Father, then the world's going to treat you the way it treated him. It's going to be hostile toward you. But the Lord said to his disciples, Take courage, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Now again, we're in his hand. Since he's overcome the world, conquered, conquered it, we too will conquer it. We're more than conquerors. And the present may be rough, and it, as I've said before, I've said in this lesson, it will, it will get rough for all of us in ways and at times. The Lord doesn't promise us an end to troubles in this world. This is a fallen world, and we will pass through the troubles of this world to enter into the kingdom of God. But the, the future and that kingdom to come is secure, and it is glorious beyond comparison. Our life of faith is producing, in this present time, through our responses to the difficulties of life, through our responses of faithfulness and obedience. It's producing an eternal weight of glory that God is storing up for us, treasuring up for us. Now, knowing that and believing that should give us courage in this life and confidence and obedience. But that's for those who hope in the Lord, as David said. Is your hope in Him or is it in the world? Is it in its institutions, its fortresses? Those are like the, the vain idols that David dismisses here. They are an empty vapor. There's nothing there on which to rely. Look to the Lord. Trust in Him. He will never disappoint. Follow David and say, In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. In your hand. I commit my spirit. He won't lose it. Plead to the cross of Christ where there is life and security. 
We have talked a lot about God being a fortress, and I can't think of a better hymn to end with than hymn number one in the red book, A Mighty Fortress. Let's stand and sing it and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number one. It is very difficult for us to let goods and kindred go. Those are the things that we want to hold on to, the things of this world. And yet the reality is it's all passing away, but you aren't. You are a mighty fortress. Help us to rest in you, to live for you, to your glory. We thank you for the salvation you've given us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.